Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, another week of Flames hockey and another interesting series against the Jets. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt to break down this week of Flames hockey and all the news around it. Um, Matt, why don't we just jump right in? We'll give our thoughts on the week afterwards, but why don't we jump right into these games? Because it was it was an interesting ping pong week here. Yeah. Up, down, down, up. <laughs> the Flames played the Winnipeg Jets on the 1st of February, uh, Monday the 1st, and this was a game where the Flames came from behind. They were down 2 nothing after the first period. Tanev got his first goals of Flame in the second. Goudreau and Mangiapane also scored in the uh, in the game, those both in the third period, to make it a 3-3 tie at the end of regulation. And the Calgary Flames end up winning this game in a shootout um, where we had we had probably, I'd say, one of the better shootout goals I can remember from the Flames in a while. What were your thoughts on this game, Matt? Well, this was a fairly typical Flames game. The mm-hmm. They had a all right start to the game. Took a penalty. It's in the net. They played all right again. Not great, but just adequate. Took another penalty in the net. And you're right there, you're down two nothing. And a fluky goal by Chris Tanev from behind the blue line in the flame zone uh, draw the team within one. And then it. As we always see, this team, when they're down by one heading into the third period, they just pour it on and on and on and on and on. And then when they actually got the lead, then they stopped playing and the Jets tied it, forcing it to overtime. I thought overall this wasn't a perfect Flames game, but I thought there was a lot to like in snippets. There were certain portions of the game where I could look at a two-minute section or five-minute section and go, that was really um, a good you know, bit of play by the Flames, but... If you look at the first period, we had, what, four shots the whole first period? Mm-hmm. Um, it felt like after... It felt like the Flames came out good. I don't know what, what you thought, but it seemed like they came out okay, but the first Jets power play really got to them and sort of shut them down early. Yeah, like, I, I even though the shot total was very lopsided, like, I didn't feel that, like, the Jets were just controlling the play and the no, Flames me were... It's just that they none of their offensive forays were cohesive enough to actually generate anything, but, you know, sometimes that happens, and it was more of a frustrating period than anything. Yeah, no, I, I think the offensive forays comment makes a lot of sense here. I, you're right. I mean, we – and, yeah, the 10 of goal was weird. I thought that both the Goudreau goals and Mangiapane goals were nice goals, and I think it shows, you know, these guys stayed in it. And I think mm. those two goals late showed that. And even when, um, you know, with 150 left, Shifley tied the game up, I thought the Flames played good in the overtime. Yeah, they, they were all right. Like, there was nothing intrinsically wrong. It's just, they, it just, it was frustrating that it got to overtime in the first place because if they had done a better job, then Shifley wouldn't have tied the game. But, you know, things like that do happen. And while you were mentioning, you know, the Flames' offensive forays, I think a big part of the Jets' success here, too, was some of the poor defensive play from the team. Mm-hmm. You yeah, know, and you look at Winnipeg, like, they're basically an all-offense, zero defense, and a good goaltender-type team. And, you know, they, they can... If you give them an inch, they'll score on you. And they did when they were given that space. But, uh, you know, if the, you can limit that, then you stand a very good chance of skating away with the two points. The next game that the Flames played, this was the game the next night on the second. Both teams played their backup goaltenders. We saw David Riddick in for this one for the Flames and Laurent Passois for Winnipeg. And in this one, Winnipeg did get the better of us. This was a 3-2 Winnipeg win. Uh, the Calgary Flames goals in the first came from Kachuk and in the third from Kachuk. So those were his fourth and fifth of the year. Um, you know, I, I thought in this one, though, you couldn't really blame you couldn't really blame Riddick for this loss. I mean, there was a tip by Ehlers. There was uh, two, two blind point shots on defensive breakdowns. Like, I didn't think that this one was a, a David Riddick problem. And I thought he looked a lot better in this one than he did in his first outing of the season. Hmm. Well, I thought uh, that actually it was the opposite, that I thought two of the three goals were 
well, savable, and that that kind of interfered with how the team was able to respond. Like, they just didn't get the saves that they needed when they did. I think savable if Riddick was in, was in had been playing, was in shape. And I think we have to remember, this guy's transitioning from playing every night to not playing every night. And that, that does do something to a goalie's head and his psyche. Um, but outside of outside of Riddick's uh, game, what what did you think of former Flames goaltender Laurent Passois, or I guess Flames prospect Laurent Passois in this one? Uh, I thought he had a good game for him, but that he's just the adequate backup. Um, like, hmm. I, you know, I, honestly, for value wise, I still think the Flames got the better end of the deal, getting Ladislav Schmid. I will say that Bersois has turned into more than I thought he would turn into. Yeah, same here. I thought he would be an AHL regular, NHL tweener, but um, you know, and maybe it's just because of salary cap era. But I think that yeah, he's, I never expect him to have a full time NHL job. Yeah, and good on him for making a career out of it. Any, any uh, besides the goaltender, what do you think of the Flames game here? Any comments on the way they were playing? Well, again, it was a similar thing. They got down early. They drawed within one then they gave up another one then they fought very hard and then got the game to within one and then pushed and pushed and pushed and ran out of time and you know this team like they really need to have the players on the bench be accountable more so with each other to like, when they're having issues, like, in the first period, to calm themselves and settle things down, to reset themselves so that way that they're able to re-push against the, the opposition and, you know, if they go down 2 nothing, go get that back. And I think this team has a tendency to spiral a little bit out, out of control until, oh, we have to try now. And so let's throw everything at the opposition, and it doesn't always work. I was trying to come up with an analogy this week when I was talking to a friend of mine about the Flames, and the analogy I came up with is that they swim uphill. They get down in a game, and then they swim uphill, and by the time they actually get to, or not uphill, but up current, if you will, like swimming against the current, that by the time they actually get to where they want to go, they're so tired, they can't finish the, the game. You know, It seems like, almost like you said in this one, they were pushing 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 but they just couldn't push hard enough and they spent so much energy just pushing to get back to zero that they couldn't you know elevate themselves over the jets Mm -hmm. yeah and we've seen this a lot of times especially last season where you know in the third period when they're trailing if they could bottle that then like this team would be virtually unbeatable it's just that they have to be in that kind of a situation to elevate their game to that extent and I think the Flames need to find a way to get their players to figure out all the details that they need to to elevate their games themselves when they're trailing like start like from the beginning of period two and go and like we're not really seeing that at any point and the next game is a great example. I hate to say great example, but an, a great example where you didn't see that. And this was the uh, Thursday, February 4th game, again against Winnipeg. The Flames, I thought, played a good first in this one. They came out, they got a goal from Manjapani in the first, and then they fell apart, ended up losing this 4-1. to one. Um, I had written down here a very complete game for the Flames. They probably could have had more than one goal if it wasn't for Hellebuck. Um, but they fell apart in the second period, and probably the story of the game at the time Sam Bennett on the lineup for this one. Yeah. And I this game reminded me a lot of back in the day when uh, it broke d- just before a game that the Flames were going to trade Ole Jokinen um, to New York. But the games, you know, they made them dress for that game and the Flyers shut them out 2 nothing, And, like, the the team was just listless throughout the game. I hope nobody would ever remember that or would ever remind me of that trade again, Matt. Thank you for that. What? You don't remember and enjoy the Alish Kotalik experience? (laughs) That was a name I never wanted to hear again. (laughs) 
Well, anyhow, um, it, this game was that similar level of listlessness, I think, throughout. Like, even getting up one nothing, I it, it, it was not uh, based on, like, the flow of the game where the Flames were just pouring it on and on and on. It was, you know, more of an opportunistic kind of goal. And then the wheels fell off the wagon in the second and third. Yeah, they sure did. And that was uh, that was a game that I think talking to a lot of people on Twitter and in, you know, in person and things like that is and that's the game that a lot of people realize the Flames are having issues. Like I think such a big loss. They really haven't lost like that yet this year. Um but I think that big 4 to 1 loss um we you know, we we've won like 5-2, but we haven't really had a loss like that. Montreal's 4-2 win was I think the the biggest most number of goal scored against us um and that's the one where people got worried and even the coach said after that game you know it's probably time for some lineup changes and things like that so i think both externally and internally that was a, an eye opener for people yeah and sometimes you need games like that to identify problem areas in the organization and they, I think, learned something from it because Saturday night, Hockey Night in Canada, the dastardly Edmonton Oilers came here for round one of the Battle of Alberta. This was the debut of, I think, everybody in Calgary but you and I's favorite jersey, the debut of the Blasty jersey, which, Matt, I made a note here. They really want to go retro this year. They have the Blasty jersey and the pants, or actually the pants from the pedestal jersey, or something very similar. Like I don't know if they just dug up a bunch of old shells or how these came to be, but it's weird to see two eras of Flames jersey coming together. Yeah, like honestly, this jersey would have looked more interesting had they had the Blasty in black on uh, the pedestal jersey with like the white shoulders. And you know, like, do a total mashup of that. And like, I think with for the a lot of fans, season. though, they associate Blasty with black. I'm not sure it would have been purchased as much. Oh no, it, it would have. It would have been like a black jersey, but just the shoulders being white with the red C. Like, if you remember that jersey, the uh, jersey had uh, like a red shoulder with uh, yes. white C's on it. So, you know doing all the inverse of that and have the pedestal with the horse head and all that. I think that would have been more of a neat blend of the two eras than what they ended up doing. But to me, it looked like a, I was watching a game between the Edmonton Oilers and the Vancouver Canucks. Doesn't it look like the old Canucks skate jerseys? Like, that's the first Well, thing honestly, uh, the that skate jersey is the only jersey that Vancouver's ever worn that I actually like. Come on, you don't so, like the clown suits? Well, that's amusing. That's different. <laughs> but, you know, for just aesthetic reasons, like, the, the Pavel Bure era skate jersey was just, like, that was a really nice-looking jersey. And, like, the Blasty jersey is like, oh, well, we just took the skate off and threw the horse head on it and, and done. It I don't just, know. When, it, I, when I saw this, it sort of looked like recycled pieces from various teams, and it just screamed to me, Budget cuts in the COVID era. Let's just put something out that we can sell. Yeah, and I think uh, it made Markstrom feel a little at home uh, just because he played for Vancouver. And, but he didn't play in that era. Uh, he actually wore – they had uh, throwbacks with that uh, jersey. So Well, Markstrom had the retro pads. Or the, I would have to go back and look, but I wonder if those are just ones he brought from Vancouver. It could very well be. and <laughs> Yeah, it – uh, not a fan overall of the jerseys, but you know, for a one-year gimmick, it, it's fine. Let's but, hope it's a one-year gimmick. Well, if it's not a one-year gimmick, uh, hopefully the next time they do something better. <laughs> but that's just me and any, you. <laughs> anyone who wants to uh, dispute us, remember we are on Twitter at Fireside Podcast, Facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. Uh, you can give us your hate mail if you love the Blasty jersey. I think Matt and I are the only guys in town that don't like it. But Well, that... it's one of those things that um, with all of the Flames jerseys, like the retro jerseys, they're fine, but you could have went with a retro-themed jersey and did something new and innovative while being in keeping with it. It's well, just you, like with every I, part of... You and I had that discussion. Instead of going back to the 80s, I wish they would have done 80s-inspired jerseys. Mm-hmm. And... It's just, 
you know, taking the easy road, which that's fine. It just gives us something to complain about. We want interesting. <laughs> I do I do like the white C on the shoulders, though. The white C on black, which we have never seen. Mm-hmm. And I think that would have even been an interesting way to go, is to, you know, to keep the white C, go with sort of a throwback, like you were saying, almost go white C, because that was the, the pedestal jerseys with the white C, and the, the different red and the black, and put that on a black jersey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it would have been just a more fun matchup, mash-up than what we saw but you know instead we got vancouver flames jerseys and yeah after this year though right the vancouver flames the calgary canucks yep exactly um well at blasty May well, well some... you know calgary did kind of like take part of vancouver's well, that's team what, that's so, what i mean it's know, kind of after this season. I- identity theft is a thing <laughs> hey guys when you come over can you just bring some of those old jerseys and storage closet with you yeah we're gonna sew blasty on them Yep. We uh, we we are cleaning up the saddle domes. We had nothing else to do. We found some old pants. Hey, I think we can put a new uniform together. And scene. That's right. Um, Blasty may have had some superpowers though, Matt, because the Flames end up with the I would say probably the biggest win of the season, a six four win over uh, the Oilers. Connor we, McDavid and Leon Con- Drysaitel. Connor and friends. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we, friend, you know, like the rest of the team, they're just there. It's just a friend. Well, <laughs> Jujar Kara got a, a goal. Yay! I mean, that's more <laughs> than one friend. But and Nurse got a goal, so at least two friends. Um, but we got goals from Elias Lindholm, Milan Lucic, Michael Backlund, Dylan Dubé, which is a power play goal, Johnny Goudreau, and Sam Bennett. Um, overall, I thought. Outside of the Blasty jerseys, which, again, I had trouble watching, I thought this probably wasn't the most complete Flames game that they played, but I thought this is one of the few games this year where they were ready to play every period. They didn't play 20 minutes every period, but there was no period where they fell apart. Yeah. They and played some portion of every period. Well, uh, the first period, they were rather bad. Uh, like it, it, Yeah. They, the Oilers were skating around them quite effectively it, it wasn't the best period they did get get that early goal but after that point like it, Edmonton did a good job uh, well, I think the shots were 17 to 3 after one like that's you're doing pretty good if you're out shooting the opposition like that but the know. Flames didn't have the offensive success in the first but I thought it wasn't a bad period for them in my opinion I thought that they were having I thought they looked okay defensively. I thought they're moving the puck through the uh, the middle of the ice pretty well. It wasn't their best period, but I think that it wasn't as lousy as some of the lousy periods we've seen. True, right? True. I think there was some effort there that you know you compare it to other second periods or third periods when we've fallen apart. It, it was not the worst period we've seen. True, um, and, and I think this is probably the first real game where we've had depth scoring. Like you look at the guys who scored: Lucic, who's on the third line; Backlund from the third line; um, you know Bennett, who's now up in the lineup but hasn't been all year. Um, I, I think you know this was probably the the complete team scoring that we needed to get this team maybe shaking some of that rust off and getting everyone going. Yeah, and it was nice to see Lucic getting the goal. Uh, he, his five points, I think, would rate him sixth amongst Oilers forwards. So, yeah. When when he scored that goal, I was trying to figure out how much the Oilers paid him to score that goal this year. Oh, I think it's like one point two five million. So, so divide that by five. You're paying, let's just call it a hundred thousand for that. That if he's got five points total. Yeah. So just over a hundred grand for that point so far, but. Yeah, it's it's always kind of sweet when the guy that's being paid by the other team scores on them. Mm-hmm. Um, and we did have some lineup changes for this one too. Before we go too deep with it, Byron Ferrosi made his Flames debut. Zach Ronaldo made his season debut, and both Levo and Simon were out of the lineup for this one. And probably the biggest change within the lineup was Sam Bennett moving up to the quote unquote second line with Goudreau Monahan. And Matt, you called this last week. You said that. Um, you know, with Bennett probably asking for a trade, you would move him up in the lineup and see what he can do. And it looks like maybe Jeff Ward's listening to you. Well, it's one of those things that playoff Sam Bennett is a commodity that every playoff team would want. And 
we don't have to go out and acquire him. He is our player. So, you know, it's one of those situations where, you know, it, it's all about finding the right mix for him during the regular season to enable him to have that successful playoffs and be a valued member of the team. And, like, it's been one of those situations where, like, he hasn't had the opportunity, but he hasn't also earned the opportunity because he keeps taking poor penalties. But he has been better at that lately. It's... So, like, hopefully with getting the goal and being on the ice for the uh, Johnny Gaudreau goal, um, that hopefully the Flames continue with Bennett on that line just for a few games to see if there's a familiarity that can grow and maybe a chemistry that can grow. And like, if We've the seen Flames Bennett do- with Goudreau in the past, and I've even said on the show that I really like that chemistry, and we've seen it late in the season uh, a couple seasons ago. Yeah, and it's one of those where like, if you're going to be able to get that to work, like, I don't think that Sam Bennett's... Uh, like, if he did ask for a trade, which is still kind of murky and unclear, um, like, it, it's understandable because he hasn't really been getting getting the opportunities to play with high-skilled players. Like, you know, he's been on the third and fourth lines for the last few seasons, and it's hard to create offense when you make a brilliant pass and the guy that you pass it to flubs it. Well, let's just so, pause there for a sec. You said it's unclear, but according to the story that's come out, Jeff Ward asked Sam Bennett at the beginning of the season, do you want to play center or wing? And Sam Bennett said center, so that's why he was ending up in the bottom of the lineup. But I don't know. To me, if you're Sam Bennett, you're smart enough to look at this lineup and say, there's no way I'm going to be a top two center. You've got Lindholm, Monahan, Backlund, even if they were to move Lindholm to wing. like To me, the right answer would have been wing right from the beginning. Well, I think, like, in his mind, like, I don't think he was factoring in Lindholm being a center. Okay, but even if you don't, you've still got Monaghan Backlund ahead of you in the depth chart. Yeah, and and I think that he was expecting, like, to be on a line with, say, Lucic and Dubé, which was the playoff line, and, you know, something along that scenario, not being on the fourth line with, you know two random players and like that's just not like it, I can understand his point yeah though at the same time the coach had said all summer he wants to move Lind home to center so it's not like that was a surprise yeah I don't know it just it seems like if he's upset with his position he was the one that put himself in that position is all I'm saying like it sounds like the coach trying to honor his wish and put him at center and that's where you are at center yeah true enough so, yeah, no, it's, I don't know, the whole thing's still kind of weird there. Like you said, we don't really know what was asked for, what wasn't asked for. Um, let's come back to Sam Bennett here in just a sec, but let's uh, wrap up this week. I, there's nothing else about the Flames that I want to talk about in that Oilers game. I just hope that this is one they can build on and ride that momentum into the next week. Anything else about that game you want to chat about? Well, it was good that uh, after the disastrous first period that they were able to bounce back and really take it to the Oilers for the rest of the game. And um, speaking of uh, goaltending, uh, Miko Koskinen is a terrible, terrible goaltender. Got a lot of money locked up in him. Yeah, and like when your other options are Mike Smith and Stuart Skinner, it's like, eh. Uh, which of these really, really bad goalies? Was the take? Koskinen deal was done before Holland got there, right? Yeah, that That's was like the last thing from Torelli. It's, I would have probably fired Torelli then too. Yeah, it's like, and you're gone. <laughs> yeah, so Koskinen's making 4-5 or five this year and 4-5 or five next year. So they got two more years of quite an albatross of a contract, and you're not going to be able to move that. Oh no, that that's a buyout at best, and like yeah, at that point you might as well just use them as the backup and oh well, eat it. They're, just like the James Neal contract, like they're just gonna have to eat that. Yeah, I noticed Neal playing on the third line um, some games this year, and that's again a very expensive third line. Mm-hmm. 
So with that game in the books, uh, if we look at the Scotia North Division of seven teams, Calgary now sits sixth above only Ottawa. Uh, we're at 500 right now. Five, five, and one is our record. Eleven games played and eleven points. So as bad as we say the Flames may have been, they have at least a point a game on average, which is not too bad. And while that might sound bad to be six, you have to remember that we have the set. We're tied for least games played in the division. We have 11, and the most games played is Vancouver at 15. So we've still got, you know, some games in hand there to make up. Um, and we've also had the hardest schedule of any team in the NHL. We've had the least to, games against Ottawa to, to boost our win total. Yeah. Uh, like, we've only played Edmonton once. <laughs> so, you know, and Vancouver a couple of times. Ottawa zero. Yeah, so it's one of those things that if Calgary uh, can get some more games against these weaker teams moving forward, then hopefully they can start piecing a bunch of wins together because the talent-wise, uh, they should be able to have some fun. It's just seeing if they can actually figure out how to play a more consistent game overall. And then uh, if we take a look at the sort of player summary on the team, guys that are near a point per game, we have Johnny Goudreau has 13 points, 7 goals, 6 assists, so he's doing better than point a game. Lindholm, 3 goals, 9 assists, better than point per game. And then the next two guys that are close are Matthew Kachuk, who has 5 goals, 9 assists for 9 points, and Monaghan, 2 goals, 7 assists for 9 points. So kind of the guys you expect to be the top of this team for points are the top of this team for points. You know, if you're looking yeah. at the four forwards you'd expect to be up there, those are the four I would expect. Yeah, exactly. Like, you might expect uh, a guy like Dil- Dylan Dubé or uh, Andrew Mangiapane to be close, but, yeah, the your main guys have to be your main guys. So going back to the, to the Sam Bennett discussion, like you said, we really don't know what's going on there, and we're seeing Bennett with a larger role on the team. Um, and we saw him sat for one game. And like you said, it's very similar to some things we've seen in the past. And we got a better game after he sat. Not just that trade with Jokinen that you mentioned, but also it reminds me of when Johnny Goudreau sat years ago. Remember they sat him for one game and he came out and looked great afterwards? Mm-hmm. So I wonder how long we're going to get a really engaged-looking Sam Bennett, which I thought we had against Edmonton. Or if it was kind of a one game, I'll show you guys, and then we go back to regular season Sam Bennett after this. Yeah, and this is where Bennett has an opportunity. Because of the fact that the Flames' only right wingers really are Dylan Dubé and Andrew Mangiapane, who are both left shots, uh, it gives Bennett some flexibility to move up in the lineup if he merits it. And, like, everything is all up to Sam right now. Like, he has the ability to take those next steps it's just can he and i think the big thing there if you want those top six minutes we saw this in in the edmonton game he stayed out of the box and you and i've talked about that's the biggest i think knock on regular season sam bennett i think he can stay in that top six i think the coach will leave him there as long as he's staying out of the box but i think as soon as he starts taking dumb penalties again you gotta you have no choice but to drop him to the bottom six Oh, for sure, and like I think if uh, he uh, is able to contain himself a little better, like even if he takes penalties where it's caused because oh he hit a guy too hard or stuff like that, well, you know those are the kinds of penalties where you're like yeah, but that was actually a really good hit, so you know yeah, but most want- most Ben penalties aren't because he's hitting a guy too hard. No, and that's where, like, Bennett needs to channel his aggression a little better as well. Looking long-term and knowing that Sam Bennett asked for a trade, now there's there's some rumors coming out that maybe this isn't the first time he's been unhappy with his role here. I don't know you're going to get, and we talked about this a bit last week, I don't know you're going to get the return you want for Bennett mid-season during this COVID season with all the trade restrictions and things like that, but if you're Brad Treliving... Is he a guy now, knowing that maybe he doesn't want to be here, that you use for the rest of the year because he's here and he's available and he can do the job if he can stay out of the box? But is he sort of a guy that you're looking to for sure find a new home for in the offseason? Well, I think that um, there's no real pressure uh, for the Flames to do anything. And um, with the expansion draft 
coming up, like, you could just easily expose Sam Bennett if all you're going to get for him is, like, a third-round pick. And He's an RFA. You know, Nobody's going to offer sheet him. No. But, like, in trade, like, I think that you'd probably get around a third-round pick for what he brings to the table and, you know, is what doesn't make sense basically i think the big question there and i i think tree probably has a sense of loyalty to bennett too because he's he was tree's first pick and you know there's always something about the gms and the guys they pick but bennett's making 2.55 right now i don't think you can sign him for that again on his next deal and i think the big question is going to be he's not going to be a guy that's going to want to be a holdout i think there's probably going to be some discussions even before the end of the season of look this is what we're willing to offer let's just throw a number out there one five sam if you're willing to take it we'll keep you if you're not we'll move you for that third yeah and i think that uh seeing what happened with andreas and the cu up north um where the oilers spent two second round picks and then let him walk died don't see the flames keeping him under a qualifying offer and i think that it, there's as good a chance that he'll just walk away as a free agent see and and i i don't think they'll let him walk as a free agent i think there's some value even a third i would take for him and i think it's going to be one of these things that if you think you can get him signed to a lesser deal next year talking to the agent before deadline day i think you do it especially if we're not going to be in the playoffs I think you have to move him at the deadline if we're not going to be in the playoffs because Sam Bennett's usefulness is the playoffs. Yeah, and I think that if the Flames are missing the playoffs this year, then I think that you'll see more than just Sam Bennett moving. But um, would we'll you, see. if Sam Bennett moved on, would you feel like we'd lost a key piece of this team in the off season? Uh, how would you say I would feel that we missed a very important part of the team, but not a vital part of the team? That's a good way to put it. For me, I feel like we've given Bennett chances. We're continuing to give him chances. I think it's up to Bennett what he does with these chances. And if he moves on, I kind of feel like, you know what? He's moved on because Calgary's not the right fit for him. Yeah, maybe he goes on to do great things elsewhere, but you know, maybe someone else comes in here and does great things here. And I think that you can't, at a certain point, you can't get, and we talked about this last week, you can't keep holding on to him for potential, what he could do. I think he's at the age now where you've got to say, you know what? It's not a fit here. He's a good player. Just not someone we need on the Calgary roster. And I wouldn't be sad to see him go because I want to see Bennett get the opportunity he wants or thinks he deserves with another organization. Yeah, and I think that you would have 30 teams lining up to try and get Sam Bennett if he is available. It's yeah, just... he's not going to be a guy who's going to knock an offer and go over to Europe. He'll get an NHL deal. The question is just whether it's going to be with Calgary. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts on Sam Bennett? Uh, just hoping that he keeps it up a bit and m might be a little bit more effective five on five, regardless. Seen uh, the coach put him on the second line. We'll call that the second line, the Johnny Monty Benny line. Now, um, we're, we started to see some changes to the lines last week, especially that Edmonton game. And guys come in. I mean, we're seeing Byron Ferrosi now. We're seeing Zach Ronaldo in the lineup. Um, Derek Ryan is out for probably at least ten games or twenty four days. So the Flames have been trying some things with the lineup, and I don't know about you, Matt, but I'm not sure that the lineup they have works, but I also don't know if you want to go back to the old lineup. I think that there's probably a tendency to go back to Johnny, Monty, Lindholm as your top line. Probably, you know, Kachuk, Backlund, somebody else as your second line. Like, what I, I guess from what you've seen, if you were the head coach, what would your lineup look like going into, you know, the middle of February? Uh, the first line, uh, Kachuk, Lindholm, and whomever's hotter between uh, Dubé and Manjapane. Uh, second line, Gaudreau, Monahan, Bennett. Uh, third line, uh, Lucic, Backlund, and whomever of the who's left over from the first line. And uh, then just miscellaneous based on the appropriate positions. Whoever is left. Guys. Yeah. Interesting. I would, and, and I know that Backlund hates playing wing, but I think I would try a, a bit of a a very different lineup for at least a couple games. I would actually go um, my first line being Kachuk, 
Lindholm and Backlund on the right. I think that Backlund is can bring some some defensive responsibility to that line and help move the puck around to the two guys that need it there. I would then go with the second line of um, Johnny, Monty, and Bennett. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, no, I, w- I would do Johnny, Monty, and uh, and Dubé. I, Bennett wants to play center. Give him the third line center. Put him with uh, Mangiapani and Levo or Nordstrom, one of the two. And I think then you still get a really good third line with uh, Mangiapani and Bennett that isn't just your checking line. Um, and even throw Lucic there if you want to. I mean, that line looked really good last year. And then whoever else you want to put on the fourth. So I, I was hesitant to say, you know, try Johnny Monty Lindholm again because that seemed yeah. to work. But I think we really need to spread... We need to spread the scoring out, and I'm not sure that Backlund is as effective as he should be on the third on the third line. That's why I might try him at wing. If we're going to try Bennett yeah. at wing, let's try it. I know they tried that in the playoffs or the play-in round, and, and Backlund didn't seem happy. But I don't know. If I was Backlund, I'd probably be happier there than being on the third line. Yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see exactly how the coach shakes things out because – there are a lot of different ways that you can really go about everything with the various um so just just to recap mine again because i know i changed my mind there so i would go uh 19 28 and 29 is one line so that'd be kachuk lindholm dubé um yeah. which you're kind of already seen then i would go 13 23 11 so that'd be goudreau monahan yeah. backland then your third line would be 88, which is Mangiapane, 93, which is Bennett, and 17, which is Lucic. Yeah. And then, to me, this is really a three-line team. And then your fourth line is whoever else we have to dress tonight. And parts. <laughs> you know, Ferrosi, yeah. um, we're not going to see Ryan for a while. So, you know, I think, yeah, yeah, whoever else you want to put in there, Nordstrom, um, yeah. Buddy Robinson, you know, whoever else they want to throw out there. But to me, this is a three-line team this year. Yeah, and uh, I was hoping that some of the filler guys that they came in would have played better, but I think that you might see later on in the season, uh, if like these guys continue to struggle, that you might see some of the kids get brought up and just for energy on the fourth line. I think we might be surprised by some of the moves that we see with the farm team being so close. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, even some of these guys, like, um, I'm just looking at contracts here, but uh, Levo, um, uh, Nordstrom, like, you know, I I think that if these guys continue to struggle, even a guy like Nordstrom, he's done at this, the end of this year anyways. Why not try waving yeah. him or Simon, send him down and bring someone else up just to free, you know, a little bit of cap space. Um, but yeah, I, I can totally see, you know, just with the team being so close, you know, as long as there's on paper transactions, that's pretty much fly to Stockton, report in and fly back. I mean, now what yeah. do you do? You haul your bag down the hall, tag yeah. up and haul it back to the regular dressing room. Like, I think you might see a lot more on paper transactions because of that. Yeah. And I think that, um, part of the flame struggles thus far this season has been due to the fact that frankly, all of the depth guys have played more like your 13th 14th forwards instead of you know like legitimately good uh top 12 forwards when we talked about it the four guys that are doing well are the top four point getters and you know i don't expect dubay or mon japan to be up there yet i mean those are guys that are playing out of position they're still young players um you know it's good to see backland get a goal but I think the Dubé and Mangiapane, to me, are still complementary players on this team. And guys, especially playing with Kachuk, Lindholm, Monahan, and Goudreau, they're they're not going to be the top point getters for this team. But they're the guys no, that have to be um, there to support them. Yeah, like those guys are basically going to be the foils for the other guys. And players that can receive passes, make passes, and, you know, shot, shoot if, you know, like the Dubé goal or... Uh, Manjapane's goals from the past couple games, and but mostly largely um, focusing in on uh, like they're just there, not like they're not the drivers on the line. It's gonna be the Kachucks and Lindholms with an adequate filler guy, and like it, we saw early in the season with guys like Levo and Simon and 
whomever slotting in on the Gaudreau line and like they just not fitting in at all uh, effectively and I think that that's why it's important that Manjapane and Dubé get those spots I think uh, Levo can still impress. I think Levo more than Simon can impress, but he's going to do it at a third line position. I think a Levo, um, Bennett, Mangiapane third line could could be a really impressive group. Yeah, well, like uh, Levo to me is one of those guys that if, as long as he's playing, he has it that ability to just all of a sudden take over a play and generate a goal or a good scoring chance. And it his problem is that it those things are not very consistent game to game shift to shift and you know he is a dangerous player but not with any consistency and i think that it's hard to have a player like that higher up in the lineup and so whether it's bennett or manjapane or dubé or whomever like there's enough or backland as you said um there's enough different takes that you can make to it just shows the we- the weakness we've talked about every show about you know the weakness on the right side and I guess what I'm trying to do with my lines is patch the hole you know like I think that Backlund is better than a third line center I don't think he's a right winger but I think he's someone you need to find a spot for in your top six on this team and with his salary and that so it's like okay move him up there and just patch the hole yeah and like you can get away with Backlund being the five million dollar third line center because he is that good defensively, but it, yeah, it's frustrating because this team just doesn't have kids that are quite ready for the NHL yet. Because like a, a guy like a Peltier or a Connor Zari might be a fascinating fit there, but they're still a year or two or three out and. Well, that was going to yeah. be my, my next lineup question for you. So Derek Ryan is out. Um, this is a guy who started the season on the taxi squad just because of salary cap restrictions. He's now out for probably, I'm hearing, 10 games or 24 days, probably not till mid-March. If you look in the taxi squad, there's really no centerman there. I mean, we have uh, Buddy Robinson, who's a right winger. Um, Zach Ronaldo is a left winger. They have um, Byron Ferrosi in the lineup right now, who's, I guess, a serviceable center. But would you just go with, say, Ferrosi or Brett Ritchie or somebody like that and sort of cobble together that third line? Or or is now, I, I guess, Ritchie's a right winger, but um, or is now the time to maybe call up a Adam Rozhishka or, um, you know, Dmitry Zavgorodny to play a month? On the well, uh, the, uh, the guy I would actually select would actually be Glenn Godden. And Godden's a very good defensive forward at, who has some offensive talent. And, and can also uh, play right wing. Yeah, and because of the fact that he's um, a defensive-minded forward, having him on the fourth line is kind of like in right in his wheelhouse. Because like, that wouldn't be the guy that you would select if, say, like Gaudreau or Monaghan went down. Uh, but it his game is more suiting to that level of play. Even if Gaudreau or Monaghan went down, I think you could still select Godden because everyone would just shift up one. So, I mean, if Gaudreau goes down, Manji Penny takes his spot. You know, if Monaghan goes down, Backlund takes his spot. And then I think everyone just moves up one and Godden goes on the fourth. Like, I, I can't see... Just looking at how deep we are, even on the fourth line with Manji Penny, Backlund, I, I can't see a time when... You know, Kachuk, Lindholm, Monahan, or Goudreau go down, and a farm guy is playing top six minutes. Yeah, unless it was Peltier, and yeah, that would be about the only guy I could conceivably see doing that. And even then, even I, then, I mean, he hasn't played for a while. I, I don't know. I'd want to bring him up first. Yeah, and I think that that's part of the reason why we didn't see Glenn Godden, and we saw Brian Ferrosi instead. Um, is just due to the fact that the more veteranness uh, from him versus the young kid in Stockton is so it, you know, it's just uh, less chance of that player screwing things up. Yeah, I can see that. Um, so yeah, it, it's interesting. I don't think I would bring up a young guy right now. I think that this the Heat need to get ready for this season. The Heat need to get things going, and I think that. Um, I, I just I think that you're best to just find that plugger for a month. I mean, you know, Ryan wasn't playing a lot of minutes anyways, and I think Ferrosi is going to be good enough. 
So we'll we'll see what happens with them during this season and if they do go to someone from the farm. But I think with the taxi squad you have and the veterans there, I think you'll see those guys plugging in for most of the games. So talking about the lineup changes and Bennett, I think we've we've really sort of you know talked about where the Flames are at currently. But we got a fan question this week on Twitter at our uh, someone tweeted us at Fireside Podcast. And this came from friend of the show, Ryan, at 76 Swanson on Twitter. And Ryan asked, if the Flames continue to be below 500, what will be their move? New player, new coach, new GM. So Ryan's sort of looking a little bit ahead of where we are now and saying if they continue to struggle, what are they going to do next? I'll take this first, Matt, and then I'd like to hear your thoughts. I don't think a new coach does anything. We've been through enough coaches. I think even if we were to go out and get a Stanley Cup coach, I don't know it changes this much. I think the GM we have is the right GM. I think that, you know, Tree has done everything he can to put the right team on the ice. He signed some really good contracts. I don't know that changing GMs does much. And often when you bring in a new GM, they just want to put their mark on the team. And I'm not sure that does it. I think personally, if they're below 500, it's going to be tough to make trades this year. I think you've you've kind of got to, I hate to say it, but ride this one out, even if it's a bit of a lost season. And... Make moves within your team. Put new guys like, um, you know, promote guys that are doing well. Even if it was taking Nordstrom, putting him on the first line if he's looking good. Or, you know, moving um, yeah. Mangiapane up there. I just don't know there's a lot of moves to be made. But, and Matt said this in the past, I think this is the last season where we can be subpar. And I think if this is a regular season, you would make moves. But I think right now, you, you're not going to be able to make those moves with all the quarantine rules. And we're already seeing U.S. teams losing games. Like, I don't think that those teams want new players coming into their bubbles. But I think if you don't see the Flames get above 500, let's say by the end of the season, or if they are out of the playoff bubble, I think huge changes are going to be made in the offseason. Yeah. it Like, I know, like, some members of the media and fan base are like, oh, trade Gaudreau and this and that and just casually dismiss you know players and like with all of this like uh, you know as a Flames fan period that um like I like Goodrow, I like Monaghan I like the players on the team it's just that uh, on the business side of it like if you're not getting it done and uh, like you've changed everything else repeatedly to try and accommodate and, you know, to be fair, like, the Flames defense core, I felt last season was rather bad um, throughout the season. Because um, I thought that Brody was very up and down, and Hamannick was just awful for most of the season. And, you know, it was buoyed by the fact that Rasmus Anderson emerged, but, um, like, shuffling the chairs around, bringing in Tanev, letting Brody and Hamnick go, uh, letting Anderson get more of a role, getting a good depth guy in Nesterov, letting Valimaki play, the emergence of Noah Hannafin. Like, just the the little things around... And those are all Trilliving moves. You can't yeah, get rid like of GM at this point. No, like, they're all just slight moves. Like, in terms of overall talent, the team's defense core, just in the raw talent sense is uh, basically the same for the defense group. But the consistency in delivering those abilities has improved. And I think that the Flames' defense as a whole has improved, even though, like, Mark Giordano has regressed a bit. Um, So, like, if you're starting to see, like, the Flames as a group struggle consistently throughout this season then I think you're you're going to see that same kind of mantra with the forward group where perhaps guys that have been around a long time, the, you start cycling them out, whether that's uh, Michael Backlund or Goudreau, Monaghan, what it, whatever, uh, to make it like lasting impact and allow some of the young guys to emerge, like a Dubé and a Manjapane and... Yeah. You said you said that we've seen uh, Goudreau sort of, you know, or not Goudreau, Giordano go downhill, but is he regressing any more than the guy you'd expect for his age? Like, to me, we're not seeing any no. more than age-related regression. It's not like he's no. he's playing terrible. He plays like a guy I'd expect at that age, but the Flames need to make sure. And I think with what we're seeing from Hannafin this year, I think we just need to make sure we have the right guy behind him 
to pick up those pieces. Yeah, and like with Noah Hannafin, like uh, to me, I think we're starting to see like the emergence of Duncan Keith, and when uh, Brian Campbell was the guy in Chicago, I reference the Blackhawks a lot just because of the youth of our defense core and the talent level, and I think that you're starting to see Hannafin take that next step where he's emerging as a top tier defensive defenseman who can chip in and I to me he's been the best defenseman on the flames and I think that moving forward if that continues then obviously Giordano's pair becomes the second pair and you know you it just creates a lot more flexibility where you can have Valimaki jump up with Anderson at some point and even moving Giordano further down in the lineup if necessary and I know I talked last week, and I've talked in the past about moving Johnny Goudreau. And when I'm talking about moving Goudreau, you're not moving Goudreau for spare parts or moving him simply to get him out of town. You're moving him for an equally talented player or sort of package of players. And I think that there is still value to moving him, especially if you think that Matthew Kachuk is your top left winger, to fill holes in the lineup. Like, I'm not saying we should just blow this thing up and get rid of Goudreau for a couple draft picks. You yeah, move Goudreau for roster like, players. It's sort of like the uh, Dougie Hamilton trade. Like, it was apparent that Hamilton wasn't a good fit organizationally, and they maximized the value of that by getting Hannafin and Elias Lindholm. And yeah, they lost a good player in Michael Furland and a good prospect who didn't want to sign here in Adam Fox. Who didn't sign in Carolina either, um, but you know, like sometimes you have in order to get the good players like Lindholm and like Hannafin, you need to be able to give up a good player in return. It, you you don't see Dougie uh, Doug Gilmore type trades where uh, you know one team gets like all of the good players and the other team gets all of the mediocre ones. Like it just it that those don't happen. I think even a better example, you know, in recent memory would be the uh, the Line A deal, right? Two guys that just need a change of scenery, and you swapped one for the other. Like, you'll get a high-end player on both sides. Yeah, exactly. Like, it, it, in a hypothetical, you'd probably get a guy like Travis Konechny and, say, like Shane Gossesbear in a deal with Philly if you're, you know, something along that lines with other parts. Yeah. So, I mean, sides, I'm, but... I'm not trying to say let's trade Johnny because I think that, you know, the sky is falling, let's get value. I'm saying trade Johnny to get an equally valuable player who fills a hole that we have. I would say that on the left with Kachuk, Goudreau, Dubé, Mangiapane, Bennett, we don't need as many left wingers as we have. So move one, get a right winger. Pro you know, solve the problem that way instead of going shopping free agency. So I think that when I'm talking about moving Goudreau, which I still think they should do after this season – win, lose, or draw unless they win the Stanley Cup. Um, I think you're moving Goudreau to to get value out of him, not just to move him out of town and, you know, take scraps. No, no exactly. Like This it, isn't going to be know, the Jerome McGinley deal. Yeah, like if, say, a team offered, like, the 12th overall pick and, like, two good prospects, it'd be like, nah, not really. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks. I, yeah, at this point, I'm not trying to take futures. It's roster player or bust. I don't want your your pick in this year's draft. I need a player that can slot into my top six. Yeah, and like we're seeing some of the younger guys in the system showing flashes of brilliance that like they may emerge down the road as top six forwards, whether it's the guys like Patterson, Phillips, uh, Peltier. But they're not Zari. there next year. No, uh, but like that... At least the Flames have guys that are potential replacements down the road in terms of, you know, like if you're promoting, say, guys like Dubé and Manjapane, you guys are top six forwards now. Then you need those depth guys to come up so, you know, you're backfilling the third and fourth line guys with quality young guys and, yeah. I'm always worried when a team brings up a guy who's played in the AHL and says they're top six ready. Like, if they were top six ready, they would have been here. I, I think, you know, you need to replace you need to replace Goudreau with a top six guy. Like you said, there's other guys that might be sort of ready or almost ready, but you put them in your bottom six and you make them earn their way up. You don't yeah, exactly. move like, Goudreau for number 12 and say, you know, all right, Pedersen, you're, you know, playing with Monaghan and, and Bennett or something like that. 
No, and that like that's where you'd see Dubé and Majapane getting like okay, you two guys, you're in the top six now. Period. Yeah, but even then, I don't think that moving Gujo for a pick and moving Manjapani really solves anything. No, neither do I. You you but, move Gujo for a top end roster player at a different position. Yeah. So yeah, so do, I mean, I just wanted to clarify because I did get some DMs on Twitter about, oh, you hate the Flames, you want to move Gujo. I want to move Gujo to make the team better, and Gujo is the asset that is going to get us the most right now. I mean, outside of our goaltender, who we're not moving. Goudreau is the guy that gets us the most return. Yeah, and like frankly, like I, you know, I want the Flames to win the Stanley Cup. Would I like Goudreau to win the Stanley Cup with the Flames? Yes, but if you know it requires him getting dealt to get the Flames the Stanley Cup, you know, not ideal, but it, it is what it is. Uh, you have to sometimes you have to make those kinds of trades. You so have like to give to get. Yeah, it's like the Brett Hull trade uh, to get Rick Walmsley and uh, Rob Ramage. You know, yeah, we gave up one hell of a good young player at the time, but the Flames won the Cup. So it's like, yeah, do you really care? Not really. And I think, like, it, if the situation dictates that certain players have to go to get us to that end goal, then... It, it would be worth it if the Flames do end up winning that Stanley Cup. But, but and it's not the, like, oh, we must deal him right now just because. No, for sure. You don't just move him to move him right now, especially when he's the top goal getter on the team. But I think that makes him even more valuable in the offseason if he's our mm -hmm. top point producer. But I think that, you know, and people have said, well, I like Goudreau. I don't want him to go. And I've said, you know what? You'll like the guy that we trade Goudreau for just as much, if not more. Because well, if you're getting like, rid of such a good asset, you're going to get a great asset back. Well, it's just like when uh, the Flames were, uh, they dealt Jerome McGinley. Like, a, a lot of fans were disappointed and sad and all that. But, uh, like, frankly, for, like, three or four years prior to that trade, like, it, it would have been good to move on and start a little bit of a rebuild, like when the Flames started missing the playoffs consistently. They, they hung on too long, and they yeah, paid the price. Because, well, what did the Flames get for Ginla? Nothing. Like Same thing uh, with Kipper. As much as I'm happy he retired here, there was value to be had if we would have moved him out of town. Yeah, and, you know, like that, the little things like that – stall the rebuild a bit and you know like if the flames had just cut bait when even though it would have sucked to see guys like again and kipper move on earlier you know like the writing's on the wall and you know like if the flames were to trade Gaudreau, like it's not the ideal but it's better to do it when you're maximizing the assets so someone's hot yeah and it's not ideal, but. So, yeah, I just wanted to clarify those comments from last week that I don't think that we're moving Goudreau just to move him because he's a terrible player. You're moving him because he's a valuable asset to make the team better. Yeah. And, you know, I'll, like, I'd be sad to see him go too, but I'd be excited by, I'm excited, and you and I have talked a lot about it in the past, what does the return look like? And I'd be excited to see what we'd get back for him. I think any, I trust Tree, I don't know about you, but I trust him as a GM. Yeah. I think he's the best GM we've had in a while to maximize that return. Honestly, I think that Tree's the best general manager the Flames have had since Fletcher. And I don't That's really, a while. Yeah. So, like, a, a few years, you know, what, 32? So, yeah. A while. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, he's, you know, and I think that he's, if you change out, if you change out, uh, GMs, GMs always go through this process of wanting to evaluate everything. I mean, like you said, Fletcher, we had Fletcher, then Risebrow, Coates, Button, Daryl Sutter, Jay Feaster, Brian Burke, Brad Trilliving. And if you look at the last couple guys there, I mean, Feaster, Burke, they wanted to go through this process of evaluating the organization. I don't think you have time to evaluate the organization. I think you need to. You know, you need to know what you've got and be able to strike while the iron's hot. And I think unless you were to bring, say, Connie up or um, Pascal up, and I don't think that's the right move to move one of those guys to GM, I think Tree's the right guy. He's shown that he's done great things. I think the issue's not with what Tree's done. He's put the right lineup on the ice, and I trust he's the right guy to get the right well, return. Well, not only that, like, he's not been... Like, when certain things become apparent 
that, like, say, like, when Dougie Hamilton wasn't fitting as expected, that, okay, yeah, we got him, great. Now move him out for something else. And, like, when the situation dictates, he's not afraid to pull that trigger. And he's also not afraid to sort of go back on his own deals. And often we see GMs keep their own bad deals because it's their deal. I mean, if you look at the guys that we're paying right now, Troy Brower and Michael Stone, who we've, you know, bought out, those are both his deals. And he was able to get he was okay to get out of his own deal, which I really admire about him as well. You know, he's willing to try something to clean up his own mess, not just keep it because well I signed that deal. Well, like even uh James Neal, like Milan yeah. Lucic, uh, you know, as much as, you know, like, oh, yeah, he's getting over $5 million and, you know, he's the third, fourth liner. It was the only thing you were going to get for Neil. Well, not only that, Lucic actually does have a good positive impact on the games. And, like, if he was making, say, $3 million, I don't think that there would be a single person in, that's a Flames fan that would be complaining about that. It's just that, unfortunately, you know, five, but... Mm-hmm. You know, but again, he found is, a way to get out of a bad deal. Yeah, a bad attitude, bad character, and somebody who, for somebody who actually contributes, even if it's not on the score sheet. But there was a lot of GMs that would have kept that deal because it was their mm. deal. Yeah, and hoping that Neil would bounce back, even though, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I can't, you know, every GM, no one can show me a GM that's never made a mistake. Even some of the greats, you know, Ken Holland when Detroit was at their peak, they made mistakes. Like no one can show me a GM that hasn't made a mistake or hasn't made a couple of bad deals here and there. Um, but overall, I think Tree's done exactly what the Flames need him to do. The issue's not upstairs. Yeah, well, like it, it's been apparent for like the last couple seasons that the Flames have needed goaltending and better consistency from their defense score. And he's tried to address that by getting guys like Hamilton, like Kamenek, um, cycling in guys who are good in terms of the advanced statistics like Brian Elliott, like Mike Smith, that they didn't pan out, but, you know, or uh, Cam Talbot even. And, but he put the right guys in the ice. Yeah, and then it's like, okay, well, th- those guys weren't fitting still, so let's break the bank and go and get the really good top tier guy in Markstrom and you know like solve that problem for a while now and you know fix the defense core once and for all and you know like as problems become evident change it up so that way it's fixed at least even temporarily and I think that like if the flames continue to struggle then I think the next big thing will be shaking up the forward group to reallocate things and yeah and i don't think you fix the forward group through free agency like if i look at the goalies i'm happy with markstrom and whoever that's been solved if i look at the defensive group good enough even if they're not all performing the way we need them to giordano anderson tanev hannafin is a great top four add in valimaki you know some guys will be more consistent than others but the forward group we have obvious holes and they're on the right side so if you need yeah. to solve the hole, you're going to have to give someone up to do it. You can't just go and sign a bunch yeah. of right-wingers. And by the way, just uh, as a point, um, Nikita Nesterov, boy, has that been a really good signing by the Flames. He has really been one of the best number six defensemen that I can recall in Flames history for like the last 15, 20 years. I agree. I don't know if he'll be here past this year because I think he could be a guy like a four-board who looks good and gets bigger money elsewhere. And I think they also want to bring in a younger guy, be that um, Shillington or someone else next year in that position. But um, if he's affordable, I'd say bring him back. But I can see this yeah. being his reintroduction to the league and he'll get paid more to go elsewhere. Yeah. I, like, if he plays like this all season, I could see him getting a two and a half, three million $3 million contract from somebody. And I don't want to pay him that much. I think he's great, but I don't think he's worth that on this, yeah. on this roster. That would make him essentially worth half as much as Anderson, and I'm not sure we're there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, lineups lineups are a tricky thing. And to answer Ryan's question, if they have to make a move, new coach, new GM, new player, I think we're going to see less coaches fired this year as well because even coaches, I would imagine, you got to go through the bubble. So 
I mean, I don't know for sure, but if we fire a coach, we can't just bring a new guy in. He's going to have to quarantine. So now yeah. we're two weeks with what? With, um, you know, Huska as our head coach? Like, it's not like you just Which fire I, the coach, bring the like guy in. Honestly, if the Flames fired the coach, Huska would be the coach. Like, it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I just, I don't know what good firing. The, I, I think they fired as many coaches as they can fire and as many as they want to pay to go away. I think if they have to make a deal, Ryan, if I would pick one of your three options, which is new player, new coach, new GM, I'm going to say Tree will find a way to move one or two players. It's not going to be a good Johnny Goudreau deal, but if they feel they need to shake up the lineup, he'll find somebody to take a Bennett or something like that. Yeah, or a Backland or a whatever. Like, there are plenty of different options to shake it up. And, you know, with the Flames having so many good young guys coming through that could be potentially decent NHLers, it also helps for, like, with this season having so many guys that are kind of fringy, like uh, Simon, Levio, uh, Nordstrom, like the, all those types of guys. Like, at least the Flames will have legit guys coming up through the system that can fill those spots and be effective even though they're young rookies. Yeah, I think you'll see a delayed response. I think, well, you know, some of these changes might be made mid-season or the deadline usually. Yeah. I mean, I don't think the deadline is going to be that big this year because you got to wait two weeks to get your guy. That's when the playoffs start. Um, yeah. So I think you'll see a lot of things that we might normally think of as a deadline move done in the off season. But I definitely think, looking at this roster, probably two at least, if not three, of the top nine are not Calgary Flames next year. So, Ryan, I think if you're if what you're talking about happens, I think even if they're not 500, they kind of got to ride it out with the roster they've got, the coach they've got, that sort of thing, just because this year sucks. But next year, I think you'll see if they're, especially if they're not at 500 as they keep going and as we get near the playoffs, uh, there's going to be big moves if this team, I think, underperforms once more. Yeah, and like if this is uh, like under normal circumstances, like a nine, ten, eleven team, like then it's yeah, you're gonna like that. That's just not acceptable, really. I mean, like I said, I think you move Goudreau anyways just to bring somebody in the lineup. But if this team underperforms or doesn't even make it out of the first round, I think Bennett, Backlund, uh, Goudreau, maybe Monahan. Like I think there's going to be a significant shift to the forward group in the off season. Yeah. Yeah, some permutation, one way or the other, but uh, we'll see. Well, Matt, I think that wraps up uh, the la- the last week of Flames hockey, so it's time to look ahead to the next week of Flames hockey. And we had a busy week last week with four games. We played the prediction game, and once again, I won. It's now two nothing, Dan. Uh, it's almost it's almost like a Flames game this year. You're getting blown out. I, I guess well, maybe it's early, but you know, like uh, some Flames games you know the effort won't actually come in the second and third periods and it'll just be like you blowing and and unlike Markstrom we can't say having a shout out to good thing in this game yeah so I thought we would win the uh, first game against Winnipeg in the Edmonton game which we did we'd lose Winnipeg two and three which we did uh you thought we'd win all four so you were a little more optimistic this past week but going into the next week we have three games now we see Winnipeg again it feels like we've played Winnipeg way too much um yeah and it seems like we've played all blue jerseys to this point. I guess Edmonton's technically um, technically orange now, and we had a couple games against Montreal, but it seems like we're getting all the blue jerseys out of the way so we can move on to another color. Yeah. Um, we, get, we have Winnipeg here in Calgary on the 9th on Tuesday. That'll be an 8 p.m. Uh, start time. Then Thursday and Saturday, we are at Vancouver for both of those, 8 p.m. start time. So Thursday will be uh, the 11th, and then Saturday is a Hockey Night in Canada tilt, 8 p.m. Mountain. So three games in the docket, Matt. Um, what do you think we do? Uh, win both against Vancouver, lose against Winnipeg. <laughs> it's it's tough to think you're going to win against Winnipeg at this point, isn't it? Yeah, well, now they're getting Dubois in. and Yeah, uh, it's just for whatever reason this team is... And the whole not... thing is, I don't think Winnipeg's a great team. I think we've been stymied no, by bad. good goaltending. It's just, I, I think that uh, they're just extra motivated from the playoffs last year and... Yeah, you know, like, I think we're oh, not playing we, great. We would have beat you, type of attitude. Yeah, we're not playing great, and uh, and we're also, I think, coming up against Hellebuck, who who I think elevates that team. Yeah, yeah, because uh, like if you take Hellebuck out of the situation, there's not really a ton of difference between them and Ottawa. 
Yeah, I'd say yeah. I, I think they're uh, still a little a bit little better. A little bit but... more than that, but not by a huge amount. I'm going to say that the Flames uh, snap their their one game winning streak against the Oilers. Um, I think they're going to lose to Winnipeg. I think they're going to lose to Vancouver on Thursday, and I think they'll beat Vancouver on Saturday. They seem right. to be they seem to be doing well. They've won every Saturday game thus far. We had one to start off against Vancouver three nothing, Montreal two nothing, um, and then uh, the Oilers six to four. So I think that we will see them win another Saturday game against Vancouver. Not the week I want, but the week I think we're going to get. What's that old Batman phrase? And he's not the hero we want, but the hero we deserve. Yes. I, I think that's kind of what we're going to see from the Flames this week. Not the week we want, but the week we probably deserve. Yeah, and it's one of those things, if this team can actually get the secondary players to contribute like they did in the Edmonton game, and like everybody on the forward group contributing more consistently than... You know, I think that'll go a long way. It's just, unfortunately, to this point, that's been part of the problem. I think that if we're going to get different guys step up, it's not going to be that Winnipeg game. It'll be the Vancouver games or the Ottawa games. Yeah. And thankfully, the Flames' schedule over the next while is kind of on the easier-ish side. So It's on the easier-ish side if you're playing 40 or 60 minutes of a game. True. It's on the difficult side if you're playing 20 minutes of a hockey game. True. So I think it really depends on how how easy the Flames want to make this on themselves. Yeah, and that's always the question. It reminds me of that scene in Austin Powers when, what is it, he hits on a five or something at Blackjack, and he says, I also like to live dangerously. Like It almost seems like the Flames are just going into this, you know, wanting to live dangerously and making it deliberately hard on themselves. Yeah. All right, well, Matt, I think that's about it for this week. Enjoy these games against, I would say, the Blue Shirts, but that's the uh, that's the Rangers. So Winnipeg and Vancouver and whatever iterations. I don't know who's wearing what jerseys when now. There's so many jerseys in the rotation. But uh, enjoy Winnipeg, enjoy Vancouver, and we'll talk to you on Valentine's Day. Hopefully that this uh, week upcoming is a little bit more normal Flames hockey instead of the um, lackluster effort flames hockey though. but like luster effort is normal flames hockey well usually when they're playing better those comebacks actually work <laughs> yeah but usually that's in the second half of the season we're not there yet true uh well as always go flames go fireside chat is hosted by dan stevenson co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.